It's a pleasure to welcome Xavier Pla once more to Stanford. For those of you who have not met him, and I think that there's very few of you who have not, uh, uh, I shall say that uh, quite briefly that he's associate professor in theory of literature and contemporary Catalan literature in the Department of Philology and Communication, and he's the director of the doctoral program in the School of Humanities at the Universitat de Girona. Javier obtained his uh, PhD, uh, rather that PhD in comparative literature at the Université de Paris-Sorbonne, uh, Paris 4, with a thesis on the concept of écriture in the work of Josep Pla, from referential autobiography to fictional autobiography. He has held visiting positions at the Université de Paris-Sorbonne, at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, and at Stanford University as the occupant of the Ginebra Serra Chair in Catalan Studies in 2008. Uh, and I'll uh, announce, I'll anticipate that uh, next fall he's scheduled to teach as visiting professor at the University of Chicago. Professor Pla is, to say the least, extraordinarily active, participating in eight joint research groups, uh, maybe I should say nine if we count the International Group on Historical Memory that we are jointly attempting to consolidate. Uh, but it is worth mentioning at least one project on the birth of the journalist writer in Catalonia, 1909-1936, for which he is the main researcher, principal investigator, we should say. Uh, and I think that it's important to mention it here because this is the aspect of his work that's relevant to our workshop and that motivates his presence here today. He's the author, among other books, of Josep Pla, Fixio Autobiografica y Varietat Literaria, and uh, another interesting, very interesting book, Simenon y la Conexión Catalana. The list of his editions and collections of essays is very extensive. I'll mention only the facsimile edition of Josep Pla's notebooks of 1918 uh, which uh, was uh, short. Most of you already know it, but uh, it, it was the ur text for Pla's fundamental book of um, And then I'll also mention, because this is a very, very important uh, uh, work of scholarship, the five volumes of Eugenie Dorse's uh, fundamental uh, uh, Catalan collected works, the Guzari, uh, in a magisterial edition that really amounts to a work of love and devotion. Among his many awards, I would like to mention especially the Serra d'Or Prize for Literary Criticism, which is Catalonia's most prestigious award in this cultural category. Javier Pla is, in my view, the foremost specialist in contemporary Catalan literature, period. Assiduously tapping previously neglected archival materials, he has enriched the basis on which criticism can produce broader and more accurate interpretations of the key Catalan authors and texts. The title of his talk today is Barcelona 1925, at the edge of genres, toward the definition of literary journalism. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you again, John Ramon Gazina, for inviting me uh, again <laughs> at the Stanford University. Thank you, all of you, for coming. Uh, of course, it's a great pleasure to share with you this short time at the Stanford. And especially, it's uh, a pleasure to share uh, this uh, uh, seminar, uh, this uh, long and very, very interesting seminar on journalism and, and literature. I'll try to, to, to talk a little bit about uh, literary journalism. And my, well, my intention is to, to, to answer what's literary journalism. Uh, because you know that the, there is no entry for the term in the main literary glossaries or dictionaries. And maybe we can say that ne nearly every book on literary journalism over the last 25 years, at least, has begun with an introduction that defines literary journalism. And all these books spend entire chapters to nail down what they mean by literary journalism and all seem to agree uh, with the critic Ben Yagoda who says that literary journalism is profoundly fuzzy term in his book The Art of Fact, a historical anthology of literary journalism. So I'm afraid uh, I will not be different <laughs> and 
if only for the reason that international literary journalism still needs to establish its boundaries. So my first uh, aim is to, 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 to reflect about the definition of literary journalism. Because one can put the emphasis uh, on the adjective implying that literary journalism is journalism about literature. Another one puts the emphasis on the noun. Literary journalism is journalism that uses the techniques of fiction, a kind of true life stories that read like a novel or short story. But literary journalists mm, put themselves in the, in the history. Uh, Norman Myler in The Armies of the, Ni of the Night, or George Orwell in How Much to Catalonia. And memoirs may also qualify as literary journalism, which of course is true since much of what, since much of what is conventionally called non-fiction fits under the rubric of literary journalism. And not only memoirs, uh, but also travel books or essays, etc. This is only a reminder of just how porous the boundaries are between memoirs and literary journalism. But sometimes it seems to refer to nothing more specific than laudable nonfiction. So, journalism and literature are commonly seen as inherently distinct domains. On an institutional level, they form indeed separate semi autonomous fields, according to Pierre Bourdieu. This distinction is also often assumed and claimed to hold on a discursive level. Literary texts are conflated with fiction, whereas journalism is said to pertain to social reality. However, there are also institutional indicators that point in a different direction. The many examples of literary authors and journalists who have been or are active in both domains suggest the existence of related or shared discursive practices and forms. Taking a closer look at the textual characteristics of journalism and literature, the distinction does indeed uh, seem to be less obvious and clear-cut than is often claimed. In any case, uh, journalism cannot be reduced to news discourse. A newspaper, for instance, does not only contain factual news reports, but also includes analysis, opinion articles, background stories, and diverting and entertaining news content. The discursive features of such pieces, especially reportage, essays, and columns, sometimes draw close to certain forms of literature. In turn, literature goes beyond the realm of fiction. What is considered literary resides in the compositional and the stylistic traits of the text of a text, and these features are not necessarily fictional. Moreover, the literary domain has exchanged certain forms or formal characteristics with journalism during different moments in history. Uh, a good example can be found in the new journalism of the 60s and the 70s when literary authors started to write reportage, and certain mainstream journalists used narrative techniques often associated with literature to convey reality. The notion that journalism and literature share certain discursive characteristics seems to be particularly relevant nowadays. At a juncture of in which relativistic postmodernism seems to have lost most of its appeal, the discussion about the relation between literature and reality, and literature and social commitment, is rekindled. In relation to this, for example, uh, several young writers, like uh, French novelist Laurent Dinet, with uh, his novel Ash, 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 Five Ashes, or a Spanish Javier Fercas, with his non fictional Anatomia de un Instante or Jonathan Little with his novel Le Vin Beyond, they operate in a discursive space that can be seen as a gray area between both domains. They seem to attempt to break through the traditional boundaries between literature and journalism, between fiction and reality, claiming that these distinctions are artificial, or at least that the relation between these domains is much stronger 
invited than often believed. Uh, as a result of the literary multiformity of the contemporary postmodern juncture, it's not easy to discern general traits of literary discourse. Although there are important discursive differences between journalism and literature, several literary authors and journalists have attempted to reconcile both domains. Under the caption of literary journalism, these writers have invented a story, a story form that combines characteristics of both discourses. In his research into this uh, hybrid phenomenon, John Hastock, He's the author of A History of American Literary Journalism, The Emergence of a Modern Narrative Form. Uh, John Hastor typifies literary journalism as a form of journalism in which the objectified way of presenting rea reality is repudiated. It nevertheless makes a claim to be able to render a referential representation of reality. Like uh, their mainstream colleagues, Literary journalists employ well-known reporting techniques like interviewing, extensive background research, and a meticulous observation of events and surroundings. However, contrary to the dominant journalistic discursive norms, literary journalists embrace their inherent subjectivity by using, for example, a first-person perspective, which emphasizes the active role in the creation of a story first creating self-reference, they accept the complexity and opacity of reality and their organizing role in conveying it. Furthermore, Hastock, John Hastock, uh, argues that literary journalism aims to diminish the distance between the observing <coughs> subject and its depicted object. Literary journalism can thus be seen as an attempt to engage with the event and the subjects involved. Such accounts emphasize the different subjective experiences. They are making them tangible instead of just trying to give a detached, universal, and finalized account. Hastock acknowledges that literary journalism has the same epistemolo epistemological problems as mainstream objective journalism with rendering reality but argues that literary journalists have a different approach to the representation of reality and use different narrative means to deal with the representational problems. According, so to, according to Hastock, these ideas about the way to render reality have led to journalistic practice that it's aimed at conveying an explicitly subjective experience of an event, of series of, an event, of, of, series of events, without laying claim to a fixed universality of the account. Um, for this purpose, they draw on the same narrative means, and they believe that they are able to represent reality in a way that comes closer to the phenomenological world than objective reporting ever could. Um, closely related to Hassock's perspective, is uh, David Ason's research into the new journalism of the 60s and the 70s, which can be seen as a specific historical manifestation of literary journalism. And this author he, uh, focuses the attention on their meta-journalistic operations. Uh, Ason argues that new journalism of the 60s should be regarded as a protest against the dominant journalistic norms revolving around objectivity. New journalists integrated a meta-perspective to problematize the conventional ways of representing reality. By pointing the, to the conventionality of the journalistic forms in which reality is rendered, new journalism shows the problems with regard to subjectivity, the complexity and opacity of reality, and the disguised ideological position of journalists, which Hartsock also emphasizes. Ason mentions four, four strategies by which new journalism achieves this meta-perspective. Firstly, by treating events as a representative of archetypical, archetyp archetypical uh, experiences. Secondly, by emphasizing the various ideological positions of which reality consists. 
Thirdly, by underlining the active role of the reporter in the construction of reality. And finally, by pointing to its own discourse as a specific mode for making sense of reality. Um, if, you, if we relate these observations with regard to literary journalism, to both the journalistic and literary discourse, it seems that literary journalism is closest to journalism when it comes to its routines of gathering information for an article. However, the process of rendering this information comes closer to literature. Much like literature, literary journalism tries to convey reality in all its ambiguity, and in that process draws attention to its own way of representing reality. Well, without delving farther, farther into these complex discussions, I agree with the premise that what constitutes a journalistic or literary text is socially determined and therefore historically variable. However, this does not mean that it's not possible to distinguish between both domains altogether. Within a certain period and context, certain discursive norms circulate in a field. These often implicit norms determine, determine whether people regard a text as belonging to either the literary or the journalistic field. Which texts are accepted in a certain field is the result of a social process bound to a specific cultural uh, historical context. Thus, the norms that are used are uh, in no way universal in which a text, as the result of a combination of certain narrative means, is granted literary merit or journalistic authority. For a more detailed expose about how literature of journalism is socially produced, see another again for literature, Pierre Bourdieu, the field of cultural uh, production. Um, so I'm not different. <laughs> to, uh, towards a definition of literary journalism in plain two words, not, not only a, one, a unique definition. Um, I recommend you a, a very interesting book, uh, Literary Journalism Across the Globe, Journalistic Traditions and Transnational Influences, uh, edited, edited by John S. Bach. And according to, to John Bach, literary journalism has a long and complex international history, one built on a combination of journalistic traditions and transnational influences. What happens, for instance, when what constitutes literature and journalism varies from one nation to the next? Or when what passes for truth in the world press belies a universal standing? understanding. I think Anglo-American literary journalism makes clear distinctions among creative non-fiction, literary reportage, feature writing, etc. In, in Spain or in Catalonia, literary journalism does not make such precise distinctions for the simple reason that many nations have not enjoyed a journalistic heritage that contains side by side examples of literary reportage, narrative journalism, creative non-fiction, or new journalism. Scholars have struggled with the, this problem for decades and have still not reached the consensus. And still today, for example, in Barcelona, journalism and literature are too often seen as two separate spheres, one low and another high. But we know how these two spheres, in fact, constantly overlap. While concepts of high and low serve to keep journalism subordinate to literature, they have, in fact, never been clearly distinct categories. How to interpret uh, the journalistic works of Joseph Pla, of Gaziel, the, the former director of La Vanguardia in the 30s? Um, how to analyze uh, Jose Maria Espinas literary journalism? How should the, the urban chronicles in Catalan or Castilian of Kim Munzo been analyzed? What interests me to me is to reflect about a specific uh, manifestation, historical manifestation of literary journalism 
in the interwar period in Barcelona. Because according to John S. Bach, at the end of the 19th century, several countries were developing journalistic traditions similar to what we identify today as literary journalism or literary reportage. Throughout most of the 20th century, however, and in particular after World War II, that tradition was overshadowed and even marginalized by the general perception among democratic states that journalism ought to be either objective, as in the American tradition, or polemical, as in the European one. Nonetheless, literary journalism would survive and at times even thrive. If we consider the newspapers as witnesses of the modern civilization, we will agree with the fact that literary journalism was born in the 20th century, closely related with big cities and historical events. In the example of Catalan culture, beyond the historical and political interpretation of the events, I think the, the Setmana Tragica, the tragic week uh, in 1909 uh, in Barcelona, was the conflict that generated for the first time a debate in the press of the period in which the figure of the poet Joan Maragall stood out. Uh, given up his elitist position of social distance, Maragall was implied adopting <coughs> a critical and combative position from the pages of the newspapers. Since then, the new values of the writing from Barcelona, as Eugeni does, or especially Eugeni does, used the literary journalism to expose their own ideologies. It was a literary evolution that conditioned the writing, of course, not only in Barcelona, in Madrid, or in Paris, uh, in all of the big capitals, and with a special emphasis, I think, in Germany. Uh, therefore, the outcome of the World War I also had a big impact on the Catalan culture. Uh, the new relationships uh, between writers and political power, the growth of extreme ideologies, <coughs> the burden of years of war and suffering in the heart of Europe, the new needs of the readers of the press and literature did not leave indifferent main actors of the Catalan literary system. Um, the decline of the of, of a hegemony of the, the no Santista period and the dictatorship of Primo de Rivera from 1923 overlapped and agreed on a period of great richness and complexity in which Catalan culture, in needs of modernization, renovation, and visibility, broadcast, broadcast uh, signs of an enviable energy and ability to redefine itself equally commendable. The dissolution of the Mancomunitat de Catalunya, the, the, the regional government, at that time, and the prohibition of the use of the Catalan language in some areas of the public, the public sphere had resulted in a concentration of involuntary literary initiatives, publishing and cultural patronage that allow finally Catalan culture accessible, better or worse, to modernization. Coinciding with the World War I, new voices and also new jobs appear in whole Europe. The figure of the war correspondent, for example. Some legendary figures of the Catalan journalism, as Gaziel, uh, Claudia Mella, Eugenie Chamman, acquire and develop their skills in the newspapers' offices and in the war front trenches. Thus, the literary journalism has been a uh, real school of style and reality observation for many other authors especially for this real generation of journalists, writers, which marked the interwar period, as, of course, Josep Pla, Josep Maria de Sagarra, or Joan Crescens. It's intended to widely reflect on the characterization of the literary discourse on newspapers and its relationship with other discourses in the context of literary genre intersection, which oscillated between testimony and fiction and which, above all, is open to discuss about frontiers hidden and literary genre hybridization. No wonder, therefore, that discussions on the professionalization of the writers, the need 
for literary magazines and an efficient network of publishers, creating a quality and popular Catalan press, while, among others, a crucial focus of the literary life of the 20s and 30s. Although studies of Catalan literature on these years have not only increased in quality and quantity, it's equally true that the predominant feeling is that there is still much work to do about important aspects of the literary socia society of the time, such as the effervescent world of publishing initiatives in the 20s, or the very complex field of the periodical press of the late 20s, and above <coughs> all, of the 30s, bring a depth necessary to understand fully followed two generations of writers who articulate the basis of 20th century Catalan literature and, and culture. Um, in any case, um, for a number of very complex reasons that still need to be contextualized and thought deeply, uh, Catalan literature, like other literatures, entered into the 20s in a general crisis, in a crisis of fiction, does not seem to be limited exclusively to the novel, but also extended to all forms of literature. Because of this discomfort, two slowly ended up winning, winning a large number of writers, including novelists, writing prose fiction, had to confront a crisis of models, a period of transition and transformation of their narrative techniques, and their editorial processes. Both the existence of extremely varied research that finally allowed the emergence of new approaches to the novel, as well as the development of new narrative techniques, probably influenced by the presence of new ways of seeing reality imposing by film techniques, derived largely from this period of transition. These are always new ways of understanding the relationship between fiction and reality, between the real experience and the imaginary experience. Therefore, it's worth noting that the upward movement in Catalan literature of the 20s and 30s especially, suffered some literary genres, although at, the, at, the, at that time they could become still considered as minors. Memoirs, autobiographies, travel books, um, collection of literary reportage, um, biographical testimonials, uh, etc. Uh, the beginning of the 21st century has been emerging in a constant movement of interest and appreciation by new readers. These forms of writing would get full strength, full strength thanks to the rejection of imagination. Uh, among the pure novelists, and journalist writing, there would be maybe a third space to the virtues of the reporter. These virtues come from the fact that his view is to build a character that discovers a whole world while discovers himself, to estimate the reality and not give up wanting to change the world, overcoming the novel and journalism with a new art form that reaches chronic documentary and analytical thinking while retaining the desire for transcendence of fiction. Well, I think there is no doubt that Catalan writer Joseph Pla, who all through his literary career maintained a varied and continued relations with the journalism as a form of literary expression, belongs to this category of writers. Joseph Pla's literature has to be considered in the context of a tradition of personal journalism, which emerged out of the 19th century romantic movement and its focus on the contemplation of the self. It may be uh, precisely by reflecting about Joseph Plas literary journalism that we can get closer to understanding how this writer used the nonfiction literary genre to let his discourse flow. Uh, a compulsive writer, uh, a great journalist and autobiographer, Joseph Pla was also made known as an intelligent and untiring traveler. An author whose collective works amount to more than 40 volumes written in Catalan and more than a dozen books written in Spanish, Joseph Pla was a great reader of Montaigne, of Leopardi and Stendhal. He was an enthusiastic follower of the works of Ernst Hemingway, 
and John Simenon, a colleague of Joseph Roth, uh, a colleague of Manuel Chavez Nogales, the Spanish uh, journalist, a colleague of Albert Londres, the French journalist, reporter, or maybe Julio Camba. And he could be considered the modernizer of the Catalan prose. As a press correspondent during the 20s and 30s, Pla incessantly traveled the Mediterranean, and for 20 years he lived throughout Europe, first in Paris, then in Berlin, later in Britain, in Stockholm, and finally in Madrid. With enormous curiosity, Pla took part in the political events of interwar Europe, the rise and fall of Italian fascism, the Russian Revolution, German hyperinflation, the tensions with which precede the Spanish Civil War, etc. Um, this forced him to reflect about the relation between literary fiction and reality, between lived experience and imaginary experience, in a very, very personal way. His first work, work was entitled Cosas Vistas, uh, published in 1925. The title was borrowed from Victor Hugo, Chose Vue, Cosas Vistas, Cosas Vistas. And I think Cosas Vistas, this title is worth almost programmatic. These aren't things imagined or dreamed, but seen. They are perceived by an individual for a subjective and partial perspective. Cosas Vistas, the, the, the book no longer exists, uh, it's a volume that included a long self-portrait, fragmentary descriptions of landscapes, and reflections on the influence of the winds, travel chronicles, and autobiographical short stories. The book was a success. 5,000 copies sold in three editions in 1925. And the critics fervently celebrated the emergence of a new narrative voice in Catalan, the Catalan language, who claimed the Lorenzo Stern, Stendhal, Leopardi, and boasted of having been the first to have read Proust in Barcelona. Most of the book was made from newspaper articles of columns, published by Pla in the newspaper La Publicidad, uh, published in Catalan from 1923, in the section and entitled Paul Mall. Paradoxically, Pla shared many of the Academy's prejudices against journalism. Throughout his career, he constantly downgraded his own writing as mere journalism or pamphleteering, and looked up to literature, which he thought of as a higher form. So, what is, I think it's very, very interesting is that Joseph Pla is a writer who has found undermining the most rigid rules of literary history in order to elaborate a literary work which does not belong to any literary genre, but which integrates and surpasses all of them at the same time. Pla showed how the personal does not necessarily obliterate the political. But as a political journalist in Madrid in the 30s, Pla did not cover the normal bit of a political columnist. Uh, elections, or the personal squabbles of politicians, ministerial changes, etc. His columns were intensely political, when, paradoxically, they appear to have nothing to do with politics. The eye voice of the column was perfectly suited to his style, even though he felt typically ambivalent about his subjectivity. It seems like Pla constantly strives to efface his own personality. And to get closer to the truth, um, Pla always stated that he only intended to relate it his life, always hiding his identity as a writer and producing literature while pretending that he was not doing it at all. In fact, Pla writes both journalism and books with a kind of dissimulation, which always consists in a camouflaging in camouflaging the formal procedures and linguistic artifices he uses. By making his reports those of an ordinary person rather than those of a great man, he allowed his audience to put themselves in his, in his position without imagining the impossible. 
By offering us a character who is ordinary, he not only allows the reader to share the perceptions of the writer, he also disarms our suspicion of an ethos which is so good and so intelligent that our training tells us to mistrust it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if there's uh, any questions. Mike. <clears throat> uh, well, thank you. I found it very interesting, stimulating, makes me reflect uh, particularly on uh, uh, this whole tradition of literature and journalism. And when you were recounting the history a little bit of the influences on Plot, from Montaigne to Stendhal, hmm. to Hugo, and so on. I wonder, if, does Mariano José de Larra figure in at all uh, in people that he that were, were influenced, that were, that he, whose influence he felt? Um, and if not, uh, uh, were there any or many Catalan writers who felt the influence of, of Larra? Of Larra. Because there is a person who has a high degree of literary talent as well as a high degree of journalism. Yeah. Is yeah. A powerful combination of Two, and the presentation of level, it's absolute fiction. He invents stories of Castellano Viejo, what about Usted Mañana? <coughs> but at the, at the representational level, it's just the medium through um, searing social satire. So you've got everything in the bottom of the He mentioned his best articles. I wondered how is he felt or interpreted in modern or 20th century Catalan thank, thank you for your uh, observation. Um, yeah, I think, in fact, Pla and, and the other uh, uh, journalists of his generation, they, they were all uh, Francophiles, especially Francophiles. So the, the main influences came from, from, from France. But you are right, 